In that part of the book of my memory, before which little can be read, there is a heading which says, Incipit Vita Nova. Here begins the new life. Okay, my friends, we are coming to the end of our time together, at least in this format. As I mentioned a while back, we're going to keep doing new episodes of Young Heretics until the end of 2022. Uh, but that end is fast approaching as time flies. And so I've been giving some thought to how we want to spend these last episodes, what our last big adventure should be before I move on. And hopefully you join me at uh, Daily Wire Plus. Um, and I've decided that one of the major works that we have not yet covered that would really make a fitting capstone to uh, this show is called <laughs> The Divine Comedy. You may have heard of it, a little poem by Dante. Uh, no, I'd like to do some Dante together. Uh, we're going to spend about three episodes going through not just the three canticles of the Divine Comedy, which is to say the Inferno, Purgatory, and paradise, um, but also this text that I read from at the beginning of the episode, which is called uh, Vita Nova or uh, Vita Noa, depending on how you want to title it. But Vita Nova is usually how it's said. It means the new life. Um, and it's an earlier work, a more youthful work, I think, by Dante. And the reason that I think we need to start with it, I don't think you can really leap into the Divine Comedy without spending some uh, time paying some attention to this earlier work. And that's because uh, I, I, I think you need to understand where Dante's coming from when the kind of lights go up, as it were, on Inferno and on the vast allegorical journey that he takes uh, through the human afterlife in his, in his greatest work. This is another one of those books, right? One of those texts that I feel a certain trepidation in approaching. And probably a lot of you guys out there listening have felt uh, like a little bit of uh, like, it's, like it's too daunting, like maybe there's just so much there. How do you even begin? And I hope that by the end of what we've done together, we'll do this uh, thing that Young Heretics exists to do, right? This kind of classical education you didn't know you were missing. Um, we will have demystified the kind of structure of the thing, the point of the thing, what it might have to offer you, and then you will not necessarily feel so daunted about uh, leaping into it. And so what we'll do is we'll spend some time today with Vita Nuova. Uh, we'll talk also through a little bit of the Divine Comedy and its structure, um, its composition, when it was made, and so forth. And then uh, next week, we'll continue really digging into these three canticles. And it's I'm, I'm not going to go in order in the way that maybe you might have heard when we talk about the Divine Comedy. Um, I'm going to try as much as possible, rather than saying, well, first this book, and then this book, to sort of pull back the camera and see the structure of the whole thing. Um, and then finally, for our third episode, I'm really excited that we'll be joined by my friend Catherine Illingworth. You may have seen her on Knowles's Book Club, um, and she is a Dante scholar, a Dante, I would say, a Dante expert. She might, uh, I don't know if she would claim that title for herself, but I, I think I, I can give it to her. And she will specifically and particularly help us focus on Paradiso, the paradise canticle, the third and final, and I believe greatest uh, part of the divine comedy. One of the things I want to talk about here is of course, you know, the, the divine comedy story of this pilgrim's journey uh, through all these different uh, areas of the afterlife through the whole really sweep of the of the human afterlife, at least until the second coming and and the uh, you know total resurrection. Um, the uh, the thing that fixates us most is the inferno. If you've read any part of anything Dante wrote, chances are good it's inferno. It's hell, right? It's it's gruesome. It's uh, gossipy. It's salacious in parts. It it you know of course it has all the interest and attraction of human depravity, right? Which um, I believe it was Simone Weil who said that human depravity, sin, and evil um, are interesting to contemplate, uh, and, but but boring to actually engage in. And good is boring to contemplate, but an adventure to actually do. And I think this is a brilliant insight into perhaps why Inferno can tend to fascinate us. It's very easy to think, uh, to contemplate all the ways that, you know, sin would be so uh, fascinating and kind of alluring and attractive. Um, and then when you actually do it, you find there's like a lot of tedium and just drab kind of tawdriness in the actual act of sin, the actual enacting of whatever dark fantasy or desire you have. Um, whereas, by contrast, talking, we talked about this with Dostoevsky and Alyosha, right, talking about 
the good, thinking about the good life, um, it's very difficult to make that dramatic and exciting. It's not as readily available as imaginative material um, because it feels to us like we're going to have to lose out on so many things. We're going to have to miss all the fun and the pleasure of the world if we just, you know, cut ourselves off and become these ascetics. And the great works of art, I think, are able to depict the real truth, which is that actually in the enacting of it, the good life is the adventure, right? It is the drama. Um, think about what it would mean, right, to tell the truth. I mean, I think Jordan Peterson talks about this sometimes, right? What if you told the truth? What kind of adventure would you go on? There would be danger. There would be excitement. You would have to, you know, hold your ground. I've been writing a little bit about this in, in my uh, translation and commentary on Romans, too, because as we get to the end of that, Paul's letter, right, Paul is about to go on this uh, you know, if, what will eventually become a journey to his death. But there's something at, at the same time just incredibly dramatic about it, um, about the good life, about endurance uh, and perseverance and virtue um, in the actual enactment. But in contemplation, right, as as Vey reminds us, right, in contemplation, we always like to think about the, the dark and dirty stuff. And so uh, all of this by way of saying, right, we think of Inferno as the good, the juicy part of, of the Divine Comedy. And even back in, I think it was in high school that I first read this poem all the way through, I remember thinking, you know, actually, the paradise canticle is sublime. It's it's really mind-boggling. And by the end of it, Dante gets us to this place where <laughs> he's he describes, although he admits that it, you know, it explodes all language, he describes his vision of God. And it's like, it's just three circles. <laughs> it's actually incredibly abstract and sort of, um, you know, weirdly scholastic. And yet it's it, the, it, the emotional power with which it's invested by this whole journey um, through down through hell and up, uh, you know, the mountain of purgatory. Um, it, it can bring you to tears. So it is amazing that he is able to do that. And I think his art is really, uh, you know, really reaches its pinnacle in the, beatif the beatific parts of, of the poem. And so I, I'm excited to talk with um, Catherine about that because I think she really knows this stuff very well. And she understands, uh, you, you know, far better than I, has spent much more time with the poem than I have um, and can help us, I, I think, to think through that aspect of it as well. And we're also going to talk with her and I'm going to be talking throughout uh, and this is another reason why we're starting with Vita Nova. We're going to be talking most fundamentally about a question that has been with us from the very beginning of this show, and that is, what is love? Um, we started out when we talked about the symposium, kind of surveying the various kinds of uh, Greek ideas about love and the, specifically about eros, but also that, you know, familiarizing ourselves with the notion that in classical antiquity, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of relationship that we now designate with our English word love. And for me, at least, what what is fixating uh, about this poem, what fixates about Dante's work, even now, even still, um, even when a lot of the pol politics he's referring to, a lot of his life story is kind of obscure, we don't totally know, uh, it's not totally readily available to us, like, you know, who Pope Boniface VIII was, although we are going to get into some of that. But the golden thread, if you like, that that really draws me through this poem is Dante's own journey um, through Eros into Agape, through uh, physical love, earthly love, romantic love, and into divine love, which transcends and presides over all forms of love, human and otherwise. Um, and, and I think that story, which in some sense is the kind of the highest version of a kind of poem we've talked about before. We talked about Petrarch, slightly younger poet, uh, also writing in Italian. Um, and, and we've talked in another number of other contexts, including in the symposium, about that gesture, um, which I'm going to call, <laughs> I'm going to sort of talk about the ability, you can either eroticize agape or you can agapify eros. You can either kind of drag your uh, divine nature down into mere sensuality, or you can lift your physical being and your sensuality up into something higher. Um, and what is that something higher and how do you make that journey is, in my view, the most riveting part of this whole saga that we are going to spend some time with. We're obviously not going to spend enough time. It's impossible to spend enough time with this work. Um, but I hope that by the end of it, you'll have some sense of why you might want to spend more time with it yourself. Go away and read it uh, in at, at least in translation, if not in the original, which very difficult, even if you know some modern Italian. This this uh, is, you know, this is written in the Tuscan dialect, which would become the kind of Italian dialect, uh, thanks in, in part to Dante, but it's still 
quite difficult Italian. So you might, it's something you might want to go off and find a good translation. And we will look at a few different translations as we go. So let's get started. Vita Nuova first, and then uh, on into Divine Comedy. It is time to talk about my friends at Public Goods. These guys are so awesome. Any basics that you might be looking for. And that means everything from coffee to toilet paper to shampoo, to pet food, just the stuff that you always need, right? The kind of stuff of life. Um, the problem with getting that stuff at the grocery store is that they have these kind of like store brands that they've got a lot of chemicals in them. They can be kind of harsh on your skin. Like you know, the shampoo is not that nice to your hair a lot of the time. Um, and they don't look very good either. Public Goods solves both of those problems. They have clean ingredients. Uh, they're really well made and they look great. So if you're into design, you know, you don't want like some neon blue like splotch on your sink with the soap. You want like, you know, actual uh, good looking stuff. That's what they offer. Um, I really love all of their snacks, which come in these like excellent, extremely tempting sort of snackable size packages. Uh, I sort of fiend on their chocolate covered almonds as long time listeners to the show. No, um, but anything in their store, I, there's a great deal just for my listeners. You can get 15 bucks off your first order with no minimum purchase. So when you go to publicgoods.com slash heretics or use the code heretics at checkout, you will get 15 bucks worth of free stuff. That's P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com slash heretics. So I read to you at the beginning from this opening kind of gambit of the Vita Nuova, which is the short prose and poetry book, um, which Dante wrote uh, after the death of this woman, Beatrice. And it's, of course, I, I say, of course, you may not know this, but many people may know that it's impossible to talk about Dante without talking about Beatrice, this woman, Beatrice Portinari, um, although he's, she's usually just referred to as Beatrice. And I think in, that's in part because we know her not just as a historical person that Dante encountered from time to time, um, but also as a metaphorical figure in his life. He, she was, in some sense, the great love of his life, even though somewhat awkwardly he was married to a different woman. He would end up in an arranged marriage uh, with this woman, Gemma Donati. Um, and, and yet Beatrice remained throughout his career the symbol of uh, of, of the, of the divine feminine, of, uh, the sacred embodied in the flesh, um, and in the, and of the journey that human frailty, human fleshliness can take through its own embodiment, right? Through incarnation into something higher and, uh, and, and, purely beyond all speech and thought. And I think this is part of why, in fact, there's an analogy here with what Dante is doing and experiencing in his kind of physical life uh, to Dante's relationship with language, which is also developing throughout his career. He wrote uh, one of his uh, earliest works, Unfinished, it's called De Vulgari Eloquentia, and was a text about the vulgar tongue, right? And so maybe we can sort of start there by thinking about the tradition of poetry within which Dante is operating as he starts to write this little book about Beatrice and his relationship with, with Beatrice. So we have spent some time on this show. Yeah, if you remember back when we talked about the Arthurian legends, Gawain and the Green Knight, we've dealt also with the Chanson de Roland. We talked about the Matière de Bretagne and the Matière de France, uh, which are these two different uh, sort of halves of the courtly chivalric literature that comes into being. Um, in, in many ways, this form of literature in its specifically romantic uh, side is associated with Provence. Uh, and this is the uh, a southeastern region in what is now, you know, the, na the modern nation of France, which is still, you know, a French speaking place. Um, and the Provençal poets are very important for Dante um, in the kind of romantic gesture, the youthful and uh, longing romantic gesture that they make. We talked about this with the court of Eleanor of Aquitaine, um, Andreas the Chaplain. You can go back and listen to these episodes. This whole kind of rediscovery, in some cases through Ovid, the uh, the Latin poet, uh, this whole rediscovery of, of romantic love as the, the object of, you know, elevation, of delight, of, of forbidden desire, right? Um, this becomes a very important, you know, movement in art at this time. Some of it perhaps influenced also by the uh, Muslim uh, people who are in Spain uh, at this juncture. And so Provençal poetry is sort of this catch-all term that we use for talking about, and the Provençal poets, um, for talking about this way of writing in Provençal um, in, and, and, and this, this form of poetry that elevates romantic 
love, that rediscovers romantic love in some ways uh, as the kind of sublime object of poetic attention. Uh, this will move and travel uh, into Italy in many ways via Sicily. And so the Sicilian poets, right, then also become the Sicilian sort of style of poetry, um, which, uh, uh, you know, as its name suggests, is written in the Sicilian dialect of Italian. At this point, Italian is, as, as indeed in some ways it still is, is, is a multifarious language with many different dialects. Um, but in some cases, they're really drastically different uh, at this at this juncture. And as I mentioned earlier on, Dante's intervention into this is both going to be to argue that the vulgar tongue that is the, you know, the modern tongue that is spoken um, can carry forth the life that was once in Latin, um, and in some sense, even actually is just a continuation of Latin. Um, and also in doing so, he's going to really kind of <laughs> score a big blow for the Tuscan dialect eventually as the language that will become Italian, right, that will be thought of as kind of the, the standard language of Italian. Um, but before all of this happens, right? You have this kind of movement in Sicily. And it's here that we really sort of locate the birth of the sonnet, the sonetto, um, which we've talked about before, a 14 line form uh, associated with various different rhyme schemes. In in English, we have, you know, uh, we have uh, one sort of sort of rhyme scheme that is named after Petrarch. So in it's sort of Italian one, and then one that is named after Shakespeare, which is a Shakespearean rhyme scheme. So we think of these as like the English and the Italian, but effectively, we're, we're looking here in, in Sicily at the kind of uh, birth of that tradition, the tradition of uh, romantic longing, the tradition of these little gem-like constructions that we, some of which we read, when we, again, when we read Petrarch, um, and, and the tradition of crystallizing that experience in uh, sort of a, a highly artificial and yet incredibly felt little uh, object, right? So, there are a lot of sonnets in Vita Nuova. We're going to read some of them. And the question is going to become, Dante is obviously picking up this tradition. Um, and yet, he is going to transcend it or leave it behind. Or even in Inferno, he's going to put uh, some of, or in the in the comedy, in the Divine Comedy, he's going to put some of these poets in, uh, in hell, some of them in purgatory, right? He has going to give us a lot of suggestion that even the great things of antiquity and of his recent past um, need to be uh, baptized, need to be transcended. Um, and this is associated in many ways uh, with what is called the new sweet style. Um, and this is uh, another kind of uh, permutation, right, of, of poetic, uh, a poetic tradition in Italy. Um, and the new sweet style has to do with what I'm talking about, with taking this erotic longing, this, this physical desire. Um, and we would now say sublimating it, although that's, I think, kind of an anachronism. Uh, it's really more like redirecting it, right? And, um, and refining it um, in, and finding, as, as Plato talks about when he talks about climbing the ladder of love, right? Finding what it is in your fleshly desire that points you up to the good in itself. Right? Um, and in Vita Nuova, I think we can see the sort of beginnings of that. We don't actually necessarily see its consummation. And in some ways, at the end of Vita Nuova, he's going to say, I have to kind of leave this off now and return to it another time because the journey that he's taken uh, through meeting Beatrice, through longing after her, through uh, moving beyond then her death, right, and contemplating what she meant to him, um, he says it's going to require something else. And that something else, I think, is going to be his journey to and ultimately with Beatrice um, in, in heaven and in the uh, visions of the divine comedy. So let's, enough of me, let's dive into some of this text and read just the opening here of uh, Vita Nova. He says, he writes, nine times already since my birth, the heaven of light had almost revolved to the self-same point when my mind's glorious lady first appeared to my eyes, she who was called by many Beatrice, she who confers blessing, right? Beatrice is the, the one who blesses, um, by those who did not know what it meant to so name her. So somehow she's underappreciated, right? She's not uh, understood or, or the, the beauty of her is not totally grasped by those around her. She had already lived as long in this life as in her time the starry heaven had moved east, the twelfth part of one degree, so that she appeared to me almost at the start of her ninth year, and I saw her almost at the end of my ninth. So he's nine, she's almost nine. This is going to be important. Numbers, uh, especially threes, are going to be very important. And nine, of course, is three threes, right? Uh, this is the Trinity. This is, you know, sort of heavenly perfection. Uh, in some cases juxtaposed against the four of earth, right? And then you get seven, which is the, you know, divine number also creating the world in seven days, right? So this, if you're into Easter eggs and if you're into like kind of numerology type stuff, Dante is the guy for you, let me tell you. And we're going to scratch the surface of that in a bit. But okay, so she's nine. 
Um, they're very young. She's almost nine. He's, he's uh, nine. She appeared dressed in noblest color, restrained and pure, in crimson, tied and adorned in the style that then suited her very tender age. At that moment, I say truly that the vital spirit, which lives in the most secret chamber of the heart, began to tremble so violently that I felt it fiercely in the least pulsation, and, trembling, it uttered these words, Ecce, Deus fortior me, qui veniens dominabitur mihi, behold a god more powerful than I, who, coming, will rule over me. And this is going to be a major theme, right? The god Amor, right? The god Eros, um, the god of love is going to, at the appearance of Beatrice, overwhelm uh, the fullness of what Dante somehow is in his core. And this has to do with his desire and his will, right? Um, in many ways, this is, uh, we've talked before about the Christian kind of turn away from this Socratic idea that, well, if you know the good, you do the good, or, you know, all sin is a form of ignorance, right? Um, in in Paul, of course, we have, I what I want to do, I do not do. And in uh, St. Augustine, which is a major influence here, right, because this is an act of, in some sense, biography, autobiography, which is what Augustine does in the uh, in the confessions, right? Uh, Augustine also gives us the pairs, right? I, I, I wanted to do it because it was evil. And so the problem of the will, right, the, the domination of the will by other forces um, is in some sense the quintessential Christian problem that, that Dante is coming up against here, right? Um, uh, at that moment, the animal spirit, which lives in the high chamber to which all the spirits of the senses carry their perceptions, began to wonder deeply at it, and speaking especially to the spirit of sight, spoke these words, aparuitiam beatitudo vestra, now your blessedness appears, right? So through this physical act, this physical experience of sight, he's saying, now I, I have kind of contacted the highest meaning of sight, the highest reason why I have eyes, right? Now your blessedness appears. At that moment, the natural spirit, that which lives in the part where our food is delivered, began to weep, and weeping said these words, Heo miser, quia frequenter impeditus ero de inceps, O misery, since I will often be troubled from now on. So all these parts of himself, right? And in a, a minute, we're going to get into the tripartite soul in Dante, which he, you know, again, of course, this is a time of the kind of rebirth of much classical learning, the rediscovery of a lot of these ancient texts. This is going to be very important for Dante. Um, he's also, of course, really closely related to and influenced by Thomas Aquinas. A lot of uh, Dante's accounts of sin and, and the human suffering are very closely uh, linked to those of Aquinas. Um, and, and so this tripartite soul is going to become kind of more formalized as we go. But for now, what we have is just this kind of internal chaos, right, um, that is being dominated over by one force, this very uh, ambiguous and kind of terrifying force of love. Um, and it is it involves the whole person, right? The whole being of him is wrapped up in it. Um, he wants her. He very obvious. Is there, there's no question that there's like a physical component to this. He wants to sleep with her. I think we can be very clear about that. Um, and at the same time, there's something more profound. It's almost like a total union he desires or a total possession or a total communion. Um, and it's all in this chaos of many different internal selves, which we've gotten in Plato, remember, in the Republic, right? We talked about the guy that walked past the corpses and didn't want to look, but he wanted to look. He, he was prurient. He wanted to see, but he knew he shouldn't see. And then finally he ran and said, eyes, take your fill, right? And Plato discusses all these examples from literature and mythology. Um, I think that guy is called Leontius, by the way. All these, all these examples from literature and mythology in which people reveal that they have multiple forces at work within themselves. And this for him is part of the illustration of the parts of the soul. And so already at the very opening we have from this uh, whole thing, we have the beginning of a new life, right? In the book of my memory, um, there is written something which I can't quite tell you all of because some of it perhaps is not, there are no words in my language or even maybe any language for it, but I'm going to use my uh, vulgar tongue, right? Literally, but actually, you know, this, this, uh, these words that I have that I've been kind of uh, arguing for the use of, I'm going to use that to encapsulate uh, the beginning of my new life, which was the total conquest um, of me, my personhood, my desires, my uh, aspirations, my thoughts, right? By this, this pure and beautiful woman uh, of nine years old, right? This perfection. And it's, they're both very young. So it's not like an old man kind of leering at a young girl. It's actually a, you know, a kind of formative experience for him at a young age. Here's the first sonnet. To every captive soul and gentle heart into whose sight this present speech may come so that they may write its meaning for me. Greetings in their Lord's name, who is love. Already a third of the hours were almost past of the time when all the stars were shining 
when Amor suddenly appeared to me, whose memory fills me with terror. Joyfully, Amor seemed to me to hold my heart in his hand and held in his arms my lady wrapped in a cloth sleeping. Then he woke her, and that burning heart he fed to her reverently, she fearing. Afterwards, he went not to be seen weeping. <laughs> I mean, you know, this stuff is like, uh, he's so powerful from the get-go. He does not beat around the bush. And we have all this philosophical ambiguity, right, that, that you, uh, to those whose master is love, right? Well, on the one hand, of course, Christians are called to believe that their master is love, right? God is love. Um, but what kind of love? It turns out it's actually Amor, right? This kind of classical deity, um, which is either subordinate to the, the true God. That's one way of understanding the, um, the classical deities as a Christian, right, is to say, well, they're actually expressive of forces of nature that uh, in rightly understood can be kind of thought of as, as uh, you know, God's messengers or handmaidens or whatever. An alternative is they're false gods and demons, right? Um, and, and so the, it turns out that what we're actually up against is this unbridled force without a Christian capstone, that it, it has just a kind of a pure, hu purely almost human force to it. Um, and it feeds his heart to the lady, right? Uh, that, he, that he holds the lady sleeping uh, and then feeds this heart to her as if she's just devouring the, S, the core of him, uh, not not out of her wants, not because she wants it, but because he wants it, right? Because love is this force unto itself. Um, if you have read with me the C.S. Lewis space trilogy, um, there's an amazing scene in which the young heroine who uh, has kind of uh, shut off her maternal desires, her, uh, in, in some ways, she's her, like, her, her, her sex life with her husband's not that great. Um, she encounters a kind of wild uh, and terrifying vision of this uh, sort of earthly earth mother force. And uh, when she consults her sort of Christian mentor about this, he says, well, you wouldn't take this force in its Christianized form, that is in its marital form. And so you now must meet it in its raw, unruly pagan form. And there's a lot of that here, I think, in, in Dante as well. And this is going to be sort of the central problem, right? And um, so let, let's read a couple more of these, uh, of of these sonnets. Let me read one more actually, and then we'll kind of move on to some, to what happens in this text as we begin to think about um, how any of it is related to divine comedy and where we're going with, with the comedian. Okay. Alas, through the power of many sighs that are born of the thoughts in my heart, the eyes are conquered and have no virtue to gaze at anyone who looks at them. And they are now become two passions for weeping and revealing sorrow. And they grieve so much that love wrings them with the crown of suffering. These thoughts and the sighs I sigh become so anguished in my heart that Amor lies near death with grieving look, since they have in this sadness of theirs that sweet name of my lady written and many words about her death. So this is an encounter that obviously, even if it, in real life, right, never really, it never really took shape or, or was consummated, um, it, it has become this kind of artistic emblem for, uh, for Dante, right, of the total uh, conquering of, the be of, of being, right? Um, and, and in some ways, I think the, the move, the switch to poetry um, points us toward the inadequacy of pure philosophy for dealing with this alone. It's not that philosophy is not going to help us. It's not that Dante was not richly read in philosophy and capable of expressing uh, very eloquently philosophical ideas. It's that the philosophy as the kind in the kind of Aristotelian mode or even the scholastic Thomistic mode of pure solid syllogism, pure argument, if this, then that, um, is going to be inadequate here. Uh, and, and some kind of conversion, not just of the mind, but of the heart needs to happen, right? Um, and so he sees, he sees Beatrice once when she is almost nine, he sees her again nine years later, right? So you've got this re repetition of nine and the kind of, it's almost like a, the revolution of a planet or something coming back to him again and again. Um, and that's because, right, in its raw form, this really, this, this force of love um, needs submission in and of itself needs conquering needs giving up or at least transcending right in order to become uh the divine love instead of descending 
into lust. So here's another kind of vision of Beatrice that I think kind of starts to get at this, right? He, he, this is chapter uh, 26 of uh, Vita Nova. He says, this most graceful, graceful lady of whom I have spoken in preceding words found so much favor among people that when she passed along the street, they ran to catch sight of her, which filled me with marvelous joy. And when she was near anyone, such purity filled his heart that he did not dare to raise his eyes or to respond to her greeting. And of this, having experienced it, many might give witness to those who did not credit it. She went crowned and clothed with humility, showing no arrogance because of what she saw or heard. Many, when she passed, said she is no woman, but one of the most beautiful of heaven's angels. And others said she is a marvel. How blessed is the Lord who can create such miracles. Now, this is a, a key, right, to how uh, Beatrice herself in paradise is going to lead Dante out of his error um, and how Dante is going to transcend the kind of purely uh, fleshy, purely human materialist version of love that he thinks the uh, kind of Sicilian poets, the Provencal poets are in danger of getting mired in, stuck in, right? It's not that he's saying this form of poetry is like wholly evil because he obviously draws a great deal from it as well as from the classical uh, antecedents, right? Um, he's saying there's something missing here and th th what's missing is there's a ceiling, right? That this kind of is a, a horizontal human kind of love. Um, and what we need is to find the way in which contained in that human love, incarnate even in that human love, um, is the distilled seed of something higher, right? Something other. Um, and so when people point up from Beatrice and say, blessed is the Lord who can create such miracles, right? That's the key. That's the right motion. So already in Vita Nuova, we're starting to get this intuition, right? That there's something fearsome and terrifying in, in love. And it's, uh, as it was in classical antiquity, a destroying fire, right? Unless it can be subdued somehow. But how can it be subdued? Not by the will, right? Not by the mind, because that's all totally conquered, right? We are trapped in this hermeneutic bubble of our, or this hermetic, sorry, this hermetic bubble, or also, I guess, a hermeneutic bubble of our own kind of uh, personhood, unless there is some force outside of us that is also higher than the forces of nature to which we are subject, right? Uh, that can break us out of that. Um, and this is what he begins to kind of uncover in Vita Nuova. He says, so gentle and so pure appears my lady when she greets others, that every tongue trembles and is mute, and their eyes do not dare gaze at her. The, the frustration of language is important. We're going to get that a lot as we go here. She goes by, aware of their praise, benignly dressed in humility, and seems as if she were a thing to come from heaven to earth to show a miracle. She shows herself so pleasing to those who gaze through the eyes. She sends a sweetness to the heart that no one can understand who does not know it. And from her lips there comes a sweet spirit full of love that goes saying to the soul, sigh. <laughs> I mean, it's just it, like even in translation, it, it uh, beguiles, I think. Um, let us now turn, I think, to how this this work will close out, uh, even if it won't be totally finished, finished. I mean, it's finished, more finished than his or some of his earlier works, but uh, there's still this kind, it ends on this open note. So let's talk about that. We interrupt your broadcast for a public service announcement. It is cozy season. If you have not previously been aware of this, drop everything and become as cozy as possible, as quickly as possible. Uh, and Cozy Earth can help. They are a fine purveyor of sheets, among other things. Their sheets are made from premium 100% viscose, uh, which is from bamboo, and it makes them super soft, lightweight, and temperature regulating. I was kind of joking at the beginning, but I really do spend like a lot of time in fall and winter, basically from the first drop of the first leaf uh, from to become as cozy as I possibly can. Um, and I love my cozy earth sheets for that, but they will not only last me through winter because they're temperature regulating. So that means you sleep more comfortably year round. You will not get too hot in the summer comes around either, because uh, that I know can be a concern. Cozy Earth was created to enhance people's lives by offering the softest, most luxurious and responsibly sourced bedding in the world. And they have over 5,000 five-star reviews that prove they are living up to that promise. Whether it's their best-selling luxury sheets, ultra-comfortable loungewear collection, or new bath collection, you will love shopping there and you can save 35% on Cozy Earth when you go to CozyEarth.com slash heretics. That's for my audience only. CozyEarth.com slash H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S. Save 35% at CozyEarth.com slash heretics. So I mentioned uh, that Beatrice died before uh, Dante wrote Vita Nova, before he composed Divine Comedy. Um, she died young. She died in uh, 1290 at uh, the age of 24. And uh, this whole thing is a kind of, in some sense, a reflection upon her transcendence and Dante's 
left behindedness, right? I mean, it, uh, you can't blame him for having a certain sense of uh, what the Greeks would call aporia, right? He, he, he's, he's looking at her uh, impossibly high and now impossibly beyond him, right? Um, and he's asking, what of this gift that she has given me uh, or this blow that she has struck uh, upon me, can I take with me? And, and how is this supposed to be more than just dust, right? Unto dust we return. I have been making the case uh, as long as I have been with you, right? Uh, that the materialist idea of the world and the uh, uh, fruitful, the fruitless, excuse me, hope to derive moral virtue out of pure matter um, is kind of the thing, the, the big dead end that everybody's going down right now. And uh, it's a dead end that's as old as philosophy, but it is also a dead end that is kind of newly alive. And I write about this in the book in, in How to Save the West. Um, it's newly alive now for reasons having, I think, mostly to do with digital technology. Um, we are still, I think, uh, the reason Dante is, still has so much to say to us is because he's getting right at the heart in this uh, perfect moment, I think, of the transition, really, from the medieval world into the Renaissance world, the recovery of classical art, uh, the, uh, in some ways, the, the baptism, right, of the classical world, which had been sort of more thoroughly rejected in eras past, um, the, the kind of incorporation of it into the Christian vision. Um, he's telling us what we still need to hear, right, which is that you don't need to detach yourself from your body. You don't need to forego Eros altogether. Um, but you also don't, uh, you also can't eroticize everything. Eros cannot be your master because ultimately you will just be dragged further and further down into the flesh. And that way only more flesh lies, right? It's very boring. It's ultimately exhaustive. Um, and as Inferno will show, it, it creates a kind of torment, an endless uh, torment and an endless need for more. We talked about this also in, in Dostoevsky, that endless need for more. Um, so if you can't do either of those things, if you can't uh, abjure the world, um, which which Augustine also talks about, you know, you can't, for instance, stop eating, right, even though food exposes you to temptation, you can't, uh, you know, just totally hurl yourself with ab abandon into the world. What are you supposed to do? Well, instead of eroticizing agape, you're supposed to agapify eros. You're supposed to take this whole fleshly desire, which is for for Dante is encapsulated in Beatrice and for many poets is encapsulated in a, in a woman, right? Because the human woman is both, you know, this object of his physical desire, but also, of course, the most transcendent thing in the world, which is a human being, right, with a soul. Um, and so in that sense, she kind of leads him up into this thing, which all of our desires, we talked about this with Thomas Terhern too, right? All of our desires are supposed to um, go through this uh, refining fire uh, until what is best in them leads us even beyond them. And so it's not that we're going to then give up our bodies. We're going to have bodies even after the resurrection, right? Um, it's that we are going to uh, subordinate everything that is good, right, to the best thing. Um, and, and from that subordination, everything, even the classical gods, even the even Amor, right, is going to take his place in an ordered universe at the very height of which is God himself, who is good itself and love itself. Um, and so that's where Beat Beatrice is going at the end of this uh, little book, Vita Nuova, and uh, his desire to follow her, but the seeming impossibility of following her, right, is sort of the impulse, I think, that leads us into the Divine Comedy. So, he writes, I was still composing when the Lord of Justice called this most gentle one to glory under the sign of that queen, the Blessed Virgin Mary, whose name was held in greatest reverence in the words of this Blessed Beatrice. And although it might perhaps be right at present to say something, of her departure from us, it is not my intention to say anything for three reasons. The first is that it is not part of my present theme, if one considers the introduction that opens this little book. The second is this, even if it were part of the present theme, my tongue is not sufficiently knowledgeable to treat of it as it should be treated. The third is this, even if one or the other were not the case, it is not fitting for me to treat of it, because treating of it would require me to praise myself, which is the most reprehensible thing one can do, and therefore I leave it to be treated of by another commentator. So he's saying essentially at this point, right, I have exhausted what I'm able to do, what the, the full the furthest limits of my art, not because there isn't more to say, uh, but because Beatrice has in some sense moved beyond and I am moving beyond what I can say modestly. Um, and you, your mileage may vary when it comes to the question of Dante's modesty. As we go on, you will find that he's perfectly willing to, uh, by the time at least of the Commedia, of the Divine Comedy, he's perfectly willing to place himself among the ranks of the great poets, right? And in some sense to place himself above even great poets gone by. 
But this is all by way of introduction in some ways, even though Vita Nuova itself is a wonderful text that you can go in and read, right? Um, I brought it to you because I think, you know, this Divine Comedy is one of these books everybody wants to sort of grasp um, and everybody senses it's great, but it can be very forbidding. Um, and one way into it is to, and this is just a general principle for, for reading in life, right? One way into it is to kind of ask, well, where's this guy coming from and where's he going, right? Vita Nova helps you to know that, as does sort of situating Dante in his uh, poetic, what they might call his poetic milieu, his poetic, poetic environment, right? Um, okay, so where does this leave us? How do we get from this kind of uh, leaving off in Vita Nuova um, to the Commedia? And by the way, the Commedia is the name that Dante gave to this uh, vast work, to this trilogy of, of canticles, right? Um, we call it the Divine Comedy, but he just called it the Comedy. Um, so we might think about why that is, right? What's going on here? Well, Dante is telling us something by calling it a comedy. First of all, he's saying it's got a happy ending, right? Um, this is a universe with a happy ending, and that relates, I think, to um, the thing I was saying earlier about, like, we are kind of obsessed with Inferno. I think Dante, um, you know, one thing that, that Catherine was saying, and we'll talk with her more about this, is like, you know, Dante um, knows that we are sort of prurient and interested in political intrigue and in, um, and that he was interested in political intrigue, as we'll get into in a second. Um, and yet, right, the expansiveness of salvation is really what he's leading us to that. He's kind of refining us through his poetry into people that can love paradise more than hell, uh, which is an amazing thing if you think about it, because I've asked this question to you before, right? Would you like heaven if you got there now? Um, and the answer might be no. Uh, the, it might be no because we are, you know, in this journey, this veil of soul making, as it were, right? Um, and the good <laughs> is good in, in itself, but we are not good in ourselves, right? We have to uh, orient ourselves toward the good and be refined, right, through the process of life, through the exercise of virtue, um, through submission to God. And, and so when <laughs> Dante begins in Inferno, when he begins with his earthly love for Beatrice, um, he's saying to us, like, this, I, I don't deny the attractiveness of all this, um, but I'm going to take you through it and beyond it, right, to a place where you actually are going to like other kinds of poetry, other kinds of life, other kinds of love better because they are better, because they are higher, right? Um, it's sort of like saying, you know, I'm going to read to you from this, uh, like, children's edition of the Greek myths because then you'll get addicted to the stories and you will eventually want more and more of them and you'll start reading Herodotus and you'll get into this rich fare, right? Um, we need training, right? We all need training and we need a, a kind of habituation um, in order to like the good, <laughs> which is a very Aristotelian way of putting it, but I think very much part of what Dante wants to do with us here, right? So he's kind of going to lead us now through Inferno um, up into paradise. And that is the goal, right? The goal is to meet Beatrice where she is. Um, and she is somewhere that is, you know, the, as we will discuss uh, in a couple of weeks, the, it's an open question what sort of bodies are going to be involved in the resurrection. Um, the souls in uh, the afterlife don't currently have bodies to speak of, right? Um, although they do have kind of a location or at least uh, some uh, potential substance, right? Uh, we'll read from a little monologue in the poem about that. Uh, but certainly, right, whatever is good, pure, true, holy in the good things of this world, right, um, have been totally consummated in the place where Beatrice is. Um, and so how do we get from there to here? Well, we have to go through uh, all the way through hell. Why is Dante in hell? This is the next question that I want to take up. And for that, we're going to have to uh, take a little another little biographical interlude. You need Indeed. They are the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. This is, among other things, a huge time saver. If you are running a business, then you probably know, and you don't need me to tell you that your time is precious. You are the only person that knows what the vision of your business is. You are the, the buck stops with you. And so you need to be making those high level decisions that are going to bring the best products and services to your customers. That's why you got into it in the first place. And that's what you're good at, right? So you don't want to be wasting that time uh, just rifling through a bunch of resumes. You know, you do need good people. That's very important. But what's not important is for you to like, you know, toss aside the 10 different resumes that aren't even relevant. Uh, their experience isn't even relevant to what you're doing. And that's what Indeed will help you with. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you to do it 
all. You can start right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash heretics. It's indeed.com slash heretics to claim your $75 credit. Indeed.com slash heretics. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire. You need Indeed. Beatrice dies in 1290. Dante continues to develop as a scholar, as a thinker, as a writer, as a poet. Um, in particular, he has a mentor, Brunetto Latini, who shows up in hell. Um, and we'll get into that in a bit. Um, but for now, we're just talking about his earthly life, right? Uh, Latini is uh, what you might call a Ciceronian, which is to say he believes in the active life of politics informed by uh, by philosophy, right? And it's sort of Cicero, right? The great expositor to the Romans of much Greek philosophy, but in a very practical kind of hard-nosed sort of way. Um, and both Latini and eventually Dante are going to get involved in the kind of central political struggle of the day, which was an incredibly violent and bloody one and had already by the time Dante was born in Florence, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned that we're dealing here with Florentine politics as we have before on this show. Um, He's born in Florence in in Tuscany, which is to the north uh, west of Italy. Um, and we talked a little bit about the kind of developments in Tuscan art that uh, would constitute the sort of artistic renaissance. Um, but at the time of uh, of Dante's birth, there have already been these incredibly violent and um, exilic, that is resulting in exiles, struggles uh, between the Welfs and the Ghibellines. Um, the... <laughs> <laughs> the bones that they were picking with each other are extremely obscure and arcane. You can kind of like nail it down in simple terms if you think about this as a fight between church and state. Um, and this is, when I say simple terms, I mean really like, uh, you know, eagle's eye view, uh, because in reality, a lot of this becomes much more about squabbling and infighting um, and kind of backbiting than about the kind of high principles of uh the political theory that I'm about to lay out for you, but those principles are involved and are motivating a lot of this conflict. Um, you have at this time in Italy a question about where Florence's allegiance as a republic should lie. Um, what should Florence kind of what what's the highest authority on earth? Should Florence uh, submit itself to some such authority? And the options are the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. And you might think of the Ghibellines as being the kind of political side of things, the state side of things, the Holy Roman Emperor side of things, and the Welfs as being the Pope side of things, the church uh, over state side of things, the divine authority side of things. Um, having said that, what will happen to Dante is that he will become the victim of a struggle, an internal struggle among the Welfs. Um, so he and uh, Latini are both Welfs. And after the Welfs kind of take control, they split into the white Welfs and the black Welfs. And the black Welfs think that Florence should submit to the Pope. It's Boniface the Eighth at this time. That's what I was mentioning earlier. Um, and the white Welfs believe in Florentine independence. Uh, and in the squabbles over this question, which is kind of an intra wealth question, um, or I guess an inter wealth question, um, Dante's side loses and he is exiled. And this is the catastrophe. 1301 uh, AD, Dante is never to return again to his beloved home city. Of Florence. Um, and we've talked before about exile. We've talked about Dostoevsky's exile. We've talked about Machiavelli's exile also from Florence. Um, it can be a very fertile, although incredibly painful thing for artists of this period to be sent away from home. Um, and that's going to be where Dante does his greatest work, right? Where he composes the Divine Comedy. Um, and it is why, in many ways, we find him at the opening of this whole text at his lowest point, right? Um, he in some sense, losing a political home, losing your political influence at this time is like having all your idols smashed at once, right? It's like, what can you be thrown back on? Um, and so perhaps in this moment of kind of necessary humiliation and humility, he sees fit to embark upon the journey toward Beatrice that he sort of didn't decide to make in Vita Nuova. Um, and that's where we are now, right? And in fact, by the end of this poem, we're going to end up with sort of disavowing, becoming a political party unto yourself, right? So even though Dante was involved in politics, even though he had, you know, strongly held opinions about how, uh, 
you know, the Florentine government should relate to the larger powers of the world and of the church. Um, he even wrote one on De Monarchia, on, uh, about monarchy. He wrote about this. Um, and yet he ends up saying, you know, investiture in uh, political life, the deep kind of totalizing investment in political life, even in itself is an idol, right? Um, even your commitment to the, uh, to the Vulgates, right? To the vulgar language, um, which, uh, is, he's been so passionate about, which he's written this great work to kind of, uh, justify. Eventually Adam is going to tell him, eh, you know, it doesn't really, he's got this burning question. What language did you speak in paradise? Adam's going to tell him, eh, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, words are just words, right? And so again, this is a poem about transcendence, right? This is a poem about going through your attachments, your desires, um, and all the things of this world, which will ultimately betray you unless you find in them pointers toward something higher, the, towards what is the essence of the good that is in them, embodied, incarnate in them, um, that can lead you to something more. And having said all of that, I think now we are ready to uh, read the famous opening of the Inferno before next week we start getting more into uh, this whole divine comedy, right? So I said I'm going to use a couple different translations as we go here. Um, the first one I'm going to use is the one that I have spent the most time with because it's the first one I ever read, and that's Alan Mandelbaum's uh, fully bound edition of all three. You get it from Every Man's Library. I have really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to ask Catherine to recommend her preferred translation, and we're also next week going to deal a little bit with Anthony Eslin's translation, um, just so that you can get a sense of different options. The poem itself, as I mentioned, right, written in the Tuscan dialect and written in terza rima, um, which is a rhyme scheme that's uh, very, very difficult to do in non-inflected language or less inflected languages like English. Um, but in Italian um, and in any other language that you may choose to use it, um, the rhyme scheme goes A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C, right? So it's like this little uh, linked chain. Um, and it goes on like that the whole way through, 14,000 lines of poetry all the way to the end. Um, and so, uh, that's kind of what we're, you know, different translators try to recreate it in different ways. Um, and this is one that, uh, does a little bit of rhyming, but does not stick strictly to, uh, the Terza Rima, which I think is probably wise just because it's very, very difficult and sometimes contrived to try in English. Canto one. When I had journeyed half of our life's way, I found myself within a shadowed forest, for I had lost the path that does not stray. Ah. It is hard to speak of what it was, that savage forest, dense and difficult, which even in recall renews my fear, so bitter death is hardly more severe. But to retell the good discovered there, I'll also tell the other things I saw. I cannot clearly say how I had entered the wood. I was so full of sleep just at the point where I abandoned the true path, but when I'd reached the bottom of a hill, it rose along the boundary of the valley that had harassed my heart with so much fear. I looked on high and saw its shoulders clothed already by the rays of that same planet, which serves to lead men straight along all roads. At this, my fear was somewhat quieted, for though the night of sorrow I, for through the night of sorrow I had spent, the lake within my heart felt terror present. And just as he who with exhausted breath, having escaped from sea to shore, turns back to watch the dangerous waters he has quit, so did my spirit, still a fugitive, turn back to look intently at the pass that never has let any man survive. Um, very justly famous opening, right? It tells us a few things, right? We're in a region where language um, is at least as currently available fails, right? And part of the challenge is going to be how can we put language onto um, this experience of exile, spiritual exile, real exile, um, loss of the straight path, right? Um, that's where we begin the poem. Um, and it's where I think, you know, it's that combination of kind of the, the order of the universe exists, but is murky, right? We're kind of looking up at this mountain We're you know, we've left the straight path. Um, and what we're going to have to do and what we will subsequently do is chart a map of reality, right? Of, of cosmic reality, of, of ultimate things. Um, and that is going to happen first. He's not going to be able to go straight up. He's going to have to go down first. Um, and he's going to be guided in this by Virgil, right? The poet Virgil, whom we've met before, poet of the Aeneid uh, under Augustus. Um, and in this poem, uh, tragically, he although he has led others to Christianity by his intuition of, of, uh, the coming Christ, um, by his kind of, by the sort of, uh, prophecies in some of his, um, in some of his bucolic poetry and in, in his eclogues, his Georgics, um, 
he himself is never able to go beyond purgatory because he uh, was not a Christian, right? Um, and so that he's, Virgil is going to be Dante's guide. He's also going to be his caregiver. I mean, Dante calls him my father, you know, my the, the one who kind of begot him um, as a poet, right? So obviously this enormous respect for Virgil as a poet um, and also as an expositor of philosophical ideas, right? Um, in verse, um, as an epic writer. And yet, somebody that can't follow him all the way. So he has to, he's going to have to transcend. But for now, right, we're going down. Um, let's talk a little bit about the order and the structure here. And then we will take a mailbag question and we'll come back next week. Because I care about you, I want to make sure you eat your vegetables. And that is why I am bringing you Field of Greens. This is a really great way to round out your diet. Um, I am not myself a big fan of those drinks that are like either, you know, sort of weird chemical supplements or that are just like supposed to, you know, hack your diet and download all the nutrients that you need for the whole of your day. And all you have to do is just drink this like gray sludge. That is not what this is at all. This is a real food addition to an otherwise kind of uh, a diet that might be working okay, but needs to be rounded out with these essential vegetables, fruits, science-backed herbs, and prebiotics. It's actually a really lovely addition to any diet. Um, it works fast. You'll have more energy. You will look and feel healthier. And if you're interested in losing weight, it can help you to do that too. Um, but don't worry if you are one of my gym bros that wants to be bulking. You can also incorporate it into a bulking diet. Um, all of that is, is possible. You, everybody can benefit from getting more uh, fruits and vegetables and those nutrients in their diet. Um, you can get 15% off your first order and another 10% off when you subscribe for recurring orders when you use the promo code heretics at fieldofgreens.com. That's fieldofgreens.com promo code heretics. Okay, so on that cliffhanger with Virgil about to lead us into the depths of hell, uh, we're going to uh, leave the next part of this discussion for next week. We will start digging into the Commedia, into the Divine Comedy, and all that it has to offer us um, next week, although that will not be the end of this discussion. But for now, let us do the mailbag. Mailbag questions, as always, come to me on Locals. Here is one from Suijin. I want to be able to learn how to read more intelligently and what, in essence, that means. For context, I'm hoping to start a family before too terribly long and we're wanting to homeschool, but I'm not sure how to teach all the deep meanings and ideas from texts and help my children see the connections for the great conversation when I don't see them myself while I read. I know a lot of people say read more, and I've read quite a lot of classic works, but when I sit with it alone, I can tell the story is a good one, but I'm not great at articulating why. I'm not good at pulling out all these complex themes and connections and drawing parallels between the work and modern life the way you and your dad do so well. What can I do to try and have a thorough understanding of the meaningful complex parts of these books so that I can pass it on? Okay, um, this is a great question to be asking when it comes to the Divine Comedy because, as I said, this is a big book, right? And a lot of people feel, especially as if, um, you know, there's just so much kind of inner reference. There are so many um, coded, you know, meanings and gestures in the text that I don't understand. And, you know, like when I get, when I went into that stuff about the Welfs and the, the Ghibellines, right? Now that you know that, a lot of these uh, references are going to become slightly more clear. I mean, a lot of Dante's like political concerns have to do with that experience, that wealth Ghibelline divide, that exile. Um, but no matter what, everybody, unless you devote your life to studying a text, right, uh, is going to come at something like this and feel a certain kind of inadequacy, right? I'm going to feel like there's just a lot of stuff flying by my head. There's a lot of stuff that I don't get. Um, and I think, you know, you mentioned in this question that you are not new to classical literature. It's not like this is like something you've never tried before. Um, it's just that you still feel like there's a lot that is passing you by that, you know, you don't, uh, you can't kind of dig out of on your own steam. Um, and so my my first piece of advice is to uh, be to read together with other people. Um, and that can be a great addition. Like, you know, we've been using and we'll continue to use different editions of the text of the Divine Comedy. Um, but it can also mean getting together with other people, especially if you're homeschooling. I mean, there are a lot of homeschooling organizations. I don't know where you are, um, but in many places there are homeschooling communes, uh, you know, parents groups and so forth um, that have resources to help you with this and that also will be eager to sit with you and discuss, right? Um, so having a, a reading group, right, a, a, a book group of your own um, is a good way, first of all, to learn how to model that for your kids when you're doing homeschooling. Um, but 
also just, you know, means that you don't have to stand on your own resources, right? I mean, that's why this show has been here, right, is so that you can have a kind of outline, a guide, right, that will lead you in. Um, and all that background context is helpful. Um, the more you have of it, the more you have to work with when you're drawing out these these meanings. Um, but really, I think the best kind of uh, exegesis takes that information, whatever information you may have, whether it's great or small, um, and applies it to the kind of grander significance of things. And that is something you can do in conversation, right? Especially if there's things you don't understand. Why is this important? Why is this text good? Why is this line here, right? Um, if your friend, it doesn't matter that your friends are like not experts in Dante. If you ask them that, then they might say, well, I don't know, but I thought this, and I thought maybe this, right? Um, and then maybe you can together go look up like whether there are some great answers, you know, from scholarship to this question. Um, so relationship is really important here, right? Gathering with others regularly, um, especially if you're approaching, if you pick a text to approach together, um, because that's what you're really going to be doing with your kids, right? And that's what they need out of you, right? They, they don't need you to know the meaning of every text is if that's a thing, right? That's not a thing, right? The text is its own meaning, right? Um, they, they don't need you to have some like final answer. They just need you to be able to point them um, through to some good procedures on the way. And that will mean, I think, mostly bringing them good additions, asking them good questions, um, and having a little bit of engagement with others uh, about the text yourself so that you they're not going in totally blind and neither are you. Um, so I would say get together with people, um, seek out editions that kind of give you information that is valuable. I mean, most editions, most scholarly editions or even popular editions will have like some of the information I was giving you about the Welfs and the Ghibellines and so forth. Um, and some of that, you know, some of the structural stuff we'll talk about next week. Um, so, you know, read the introduction and get that, you know, background information where you can, but also share with others your perplexity, right? Talk to other people about like specific questions that you have about the text, read them together and discuss, and then bring that same spirit um, to your kids. And you might be amazed that there's like a lot in this text, in these texts, uh, in these great works um, that comes just from sitting and puzzling about them and asking these questions. Okay. That's it for me. If you like this show, as always, you will love the Claremont Institute, which is where I work. We put out two publications, the Claremont Review of Books and the American Mind. They can both be found online and you can donate to support us at claremont.org slash donate. When you do, mention in the notes that you heard about us through Young Heretics. Um, and if you haven't already, please do pre-order my book, How to Save the West, which is on Amazon and wherever else books are sold. I really think if you like this show, you're going to love that book too. Uh, and I'm excited for you guys to read it. All right, folks, I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.